Well, today we are finishing off our series called This is the Way, and we've been um, kind of using the Mandalorian uh, TV show, the Disney Plus show, uh, as our, our jumping off part, point, because Mandalorians in that show, they were warriors who lived by a strict code, um, a, a code of ethics and a behavior. And so whenever they would do something that would be in line with those ethics or those behaviors, they would say, this is the way. They would say, this is the way. And, um, and they had this belief system that embodied their lifestyle and their actions conformed to that. Now, I believe that God wants us, and in this series we've talked about how God has a lifestyle, a way for us to live, a lifestyle that we should be living. And then uh, a couple weeks ago we talked about the way of the Lord that God had planned sending Jesus to be a living uh, object lesson, to, to show us the way, to tell us about the way, but also to, to ultimately be the way. And then last week we talked about the Word of God also showing us the way. The Old and New Testament don't conflict. They actually all point to Jesus. You need to look at the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus and see him. He is there every, every time you turn around. There is example after example. So the Word of God doesn't conflict with one another. It points to the way, Jesus. And we can see it in the written Word and we can see in the living Word, Jesus, the way that we're to live. And today we're finishing off our series talking about the church. We're talking about the church. The church is the representation of Jesus in this world and reveals Jesus in truth and love. Guys, we as the church are supposed to be people who are showing others the way. I'm going to try this side of the room. No, we're supposed to be showing others people the way. We're supposed to be living the way. We're supposed to be telling the way. We're supposed to be people of the way. We're supposed to be showing our life should be an example of how to get to Jesus, how to get to God, how to, to follow him in our day-to-day -day life, our lifestyle. Everything we do and say should point to Jesus. Now, if you've ever heard the statement, getting back to the basics, you know, when anything becomes clouded over time, what, it need, what we need to do is go back to the basics, the fundamentals of where things started. And so, for Christianity, the ultimate back to the basics is the person and work of Jesus. So, we, we've talked about that he is the way. We've got to follow his way. But we've got to look at how Jesus taught the early church, how he taught his disciples to live in the way. And the way we do that is we look at how they lived, how they functioned in the New Testament church in the first century. And we see what they did to live in the way. So how, what was the church like in the first century? What did it look like? What did it sound like? How did it operate? Well, I'm going to give you from Acts chapter 2, and we're going to look at this 42 through 47. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And it goes on to say, And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So if you look at this, there's some key things that they did. One of the things that they did is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In other words, they got in and got the word inside of them. They began to listen to ones who had walked with Jesus, and they began to follow their way, to follow the teaching that they were given. They also broke bread and, and spent time in prayer. What is that? That's pictures of communion and, and, and praying together. Next week, just FYI, we're going to do communion next week. Okay? But it's the breaking of bread together. It's not just eating together, and they do that too. Okay? But then they were also, 
seeing signs and wonders. They were seeing signs and wonders. I believe that the church has got to become more and more powerful in the last days. We need more miracles and signs and wonders. Now, we can't build everything around that, but we have got to have the miracle signs and wonders operating in the church. Amen or oh me, come on. <laughs> we need that. We need, and guys, we've been blessed so many times. We're seeing it very subtly around, but God is doing works of, of miraculous works in our midst if we'll just follow his lead. He'll do it. And it shouldn't be for a big show. It should be to give glory to him and help people walk out the way. Amen? Amen. All right? And then it says they help the poor and needy. In other words, they sold what they had to help the poor and needy. We're doing that with our food ministry. We're going out and helping people. We're helping pay light bills and things like that. Why? Because the church is supposed to be an extension of his love to the world that's hurting. So we, we're doing that. And it says they worshiped and they fellowshiped together. In other words, they got together in the, the temple courts and they, they did daily. That's why it's so important. Listen, it's not so we can count you in the seat, but the reason why it's so important for us to be a part of this church is that we get together and we encourage each other and we strengthen each other when we come together. Amen? And then the last one is, they told others about Jesus. And you go, well, Pastor, I didn't see it exactly like that in it. Well, it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Well, how did those get saved? Somebody told them. Somebody was telling about what Jesus was doing. And when you're, when you're excited about what Jesus is doing, you know what will happen? You'll go tell somebody about it. You'll go tell somebody about what God's doing, and it will Lead people to Jesus. Amen? All right. So Christians in the early church, they were different from the rest of the larger Roman society. In fact, they rejected all other gods and they only followed the Lord Jesus Christ. They followed him and they challenged their social order in those days because they welcomed everybody. Okay? The Jews, you know, Gentiles, you, you had to, to, to become a full Jew to, to worship with them. You had to be a, a proselyte. They welcomed everybody. It didn't matter what socioeconomic place they were at. They, worship, they, they welcomed everybody into their worship. And they did it because they cared. It didn't matter at the time. There were slaves that came. There were people that were poor. It didn't matter they welcomed them in to the body of Christ, and they valued everybody. You see, the gospel didn't just change their eternal address of a believer at death. That's not what the gospel did for them. It affected every aspect of the way they lived. Guys, so many people are wanting to come to church and to get their Ticket to heaven, and that's all they're really looking for right now. That is not what the gospel is supposed to do. It's not just to give you a ticket to heaven. Yes, it does that. Guess what? I'm going to get to see my Jesus one day. But when I get to see my Jesus, it's not going to be a rude awakening where it's like I don't know how to talk to him because this is a continuation on of my relationship I already have with him. But some people just want their ticket, and, and, and they think, oh, if I got my ticket, then I show up there, and then I'm good, right? But that's not what it's supposed to do. The gospel is, so, is supposed to affect us in such a powerful way, it changes the way we live. I'm going to quit preaching, go to meddling, but the thing that troubles me about the church today is a lot of people want to come to church or they want to be associated with church, but they don't want the, the, the word of God or the, their relationship with God to affect the way they live. It's like, well, just take me like I am. God does say, come as you are, but he loves you too much to keep you where you're at. He wants you to be changed and be transformed into his likeness. Amen? Amen. And so when we see the early church, we see a loving and faithful and simple, simple way of they, the way they fellowship, the way they worship, the way they did community together. 
and it completely changed their world. The early church impacted the world, and yet they weren't out uh, about how much power and wealth they could. It, it, it's not about church buildings. I want you to know it's about uh, people who are on fire for God who are following the way. Their example paints the kind of picture. So here's what we have to do. We, gotta, we have to step up and be the church. We got to step up and be the church. Step up and truly let everything we do, everything we say, the love that we show, the way to showing people the way to God uh, and telling the world by our words and actions, not just our words. A lot of people, we want to we wanna tell them by our words, but we got to let our love be the thing that we lead with. with. Paul prayed this for the Philippians. He said, and this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. In other words, he's saying, look, you need to get so full of love. I want it to abound so much that every time you come in contact with people, it just, it just overflows. And where, when you bump into somebody, the love of Jesus just flows into them and just fl- overflows you. It's got to abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He's saying, look, I want you to be full of love for God because if you fall in love for God, you know what? If you truly are loving God, he's going to take you from where you're at and he's going to start producing righteousness. He's going to start producing purity and holiness in you. It's going to start coming through you. Why? Because that love is going to keep overflowing. You know, my, my wife, I think she had certain things she wanted me to change when I first got married. Thank you, Jesus, I did change. Because if she had to deal, if she had to still be living with the man I was 33 years ago, here in a couple weeks we'll celebrate our 33rd anniversary. If she was still having to live with that man, she'd already kill me by now, all right? Just FYI. But you see, when you fall in love with somebody... There's things, there's chains that you go through, not because they're demanding it of you, but because you love them, you keep pursuing them, and as you're pursuing them, you lay other things down. And that's the kind of relationship that God is wanting us to have with him. We're, we are the church, and so if we're the church, we've got to be that example to the world. We've got to be showing the world that the, the, there's a way that the church should look like. It should light, it should be a light that shines love through the darkness of separation from God. A light that does not judge. You know, it it lights the light of God that shines on people is gonna bring conviction, but it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit, not the conviction that that you give. Sadly, the church is known today as people who are judgmental and hateful. That's not what it should be. It's not what it should be. That's not the plan. God said, I mean, there's a different way to live. I mean, a lot of people think the, the church is hateful and judgmental and, and that they all they care about, is, they don't care about people, they only care about your money. How many's heard that? Yeah, you've heard it because that's what the world thinks about the church. But that's not what they should see. If that's all they're seeing, they're missing what we as the church should be. We got to show people the way. How do we show them the way? Well, let me give you this. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, this is where Paul has talked about the spiritual gifts. And then he says, Now eagerly desire the greatest gifts, greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. And he's about to go into 1 Corinthians 13. And 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. We read it at weddings. I was just at a wedding Friday. It's like, and we read it at weddings, but it's completely taken out of context. It's, it's taken out of context so many times we make it about marriage, and it's like this is right in between two chapters on spiritual gifts and the way the church is supposed to operate. But see, even in, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is only echoing what Jesus had already said. He said this in John 13. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. 
as I have loved you. He didn't say love the way you love. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. He's saying, I want you to love not your way. I want you to love my way. And what is love his way? Well, if, or, I got to ask this question. Are we showing the way by our love? Are we showing the world the way by our love? Because here's what a picture of love looks like. And it does come from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. There's, that affects that judgmental thing right there. It is not self-seeking. So in the church, it shouldn't be something that's going, hey, look at me, I've, I can do these spiritual gifts. He's, this is, you got to understand, this is in context with the spiritual gifts he's talking about. Don't do it to where people look at you. Do it to where people look at Jesus. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. Man, that is, that is the incredible way. The way of love never fails. If we would love like this, and this is what the church would present to the world, guess what? It would draw people to Jesus like a magnet. It would draw people in. You say, well, what about, pastor, what about, you know, them getting right with God? Guess what? It's not our job to do the conviction. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do the conviction. Our job is to love them. And you see, it's not loving our way. It's loving his way. You see, love will fight through a matter. Love will keep pursuing even when people are saying, no, no, no. Love is selfless. Love is willing to lay down your life for a friend. And that's what Jesus said. Greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life, lay down one's life for one's friend. You see, guys, that's the kind of sacrificial love that we need to have. Not just for the body of Christ, but for the world. That's the kind of thing that's going to change. It's going to open the doors for us. And I've got to ask this question. Is that what the world's seeing through our church? Is that what the world's seeing through the global church? You know, I, there's so many things out on the internet, and Sam and I were looking at one this week, and, and you know, the sad thing is there was a guy standing there uh, and behind a pulpit and going, I just hope every gay person dies. It's like they are lost people that need Jesus. And you know what? If they die, they're going to spend an eternity in hell. And the only way that, that they're going to change is if we, that they sense what's real love that will change their life. I'm not discounting their sin. Listen, guess what? Our lying... Our, our, our stealing, our cheating, whatever, will send us to hell just the same way. Amen. We got to love people where they're at. And we got to love them enough that we won't leave them there, that we help them move to a place of where they come to experience real love. And that changes people. Our life lived in love in this world in the, with the people we come in contact with will show the way. It is show the way. And, and that's how he said. His disciples would be known not by their theology, which we need good theology, not by how big our church is. Nope. Not by us having Christian bumper stickers across the back of our... It says they will know us by our love. The church has got to get back to loving people. Listen. When we love, when we love God with all our heart and we love our neighbor as ourself, that kind of love will open the door to the gospel. 
It opened the door to the gospel and lead people. They'll, then they'll be led to Jesus. And they, when they have an encounter with the holy God, they will be drawn to repentance of their sin. And they'll turn away and they'll submit to his lordship. And then God says, I'm just going to take you on a path where I'm going to make you like my son Jesus. Remember, that's his purpose for us, to be made like Jesus. And that's what he wants to do. And, and it's like the issue that the church has is that we're the one that thinks that we hold the, the timepiece on how quick somebody changes. It's not my job to make somebody change in a certain amount of time. It's my job to love them and tell them the truth and let God do the work of change. Amen. Jesus modeled this. He modeled this when he, when he was put uh, in the situation with the woman caught in adultery. What does he do first? He bends down and he says, who's there to condemn you? He says, neither do I condemn you. He showed her love first, then he spoke the truth. He said, now go and sin no more. You start with love, you lead with love, and you speak the truth in love. That's Change, that changes people's lives. And guys, if, if we're going to live this out, we've got, to, we've got to learn to submit our life and let not just our words speak, but our life speak. God wants us to work out our salvation and to live this out by the way we live. In fact, I want to read this from Philippians chapter 2. And, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. All right, stop right there. Guys, we've got to, we got to let God work in us. we got to let God do this work. And when he says work out your salvation, it's not working for your salvation. Your salvation is a gift from God. But working out salvation in your life is you're letting God take control of every aspect of your life. There is a working there. You know why? Because I have to take my hands off the wheel and I have to let Jesus take it, put his hands on the wheel. I have to let him be the Lord of every aspect. So you know what? There is a working out of our salvation. He's already given us the gift of salvation, eternal life in heaven. But if I'm going to let it change my life here, you know what I have to do? I have to do some yielding. I have to work it out with fear and trembling. And he goes on. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, if you will take your hands off the wheel and let Jesus take, put his hands on the wheel, guess what? God will work in you the strength to live a godly life. He will work in fruit of righteousness in your life. Why? Because he's the one that is at work. He goes on to say, do all things without grumbling or questioning. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. The problem with the church today, guys, is this, and I'm, I'm owning it. I've been here. I've been working in the church for the last 37 years. Is the church doesn't look any different than the world. got quiet in here but that see the early church was so radically different than the rest of society that they stood out they only worship one God the true and living God they lived differently that's why they were always getting in trouble <laughs> but they were Without blemish in a crooked and twisted generation. Guys, if we're going to show the way, we got to be living the way. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. He's saying, look. I want you to live this out in such a way that people see, not just by your words, but by your lifestyle. They see by the way you live that you are a person of the way. Let me say this again. We can only show the way if we're living the way. That's why a, a lot of people say, well, the church are just a bunch of hypocrites. 
The way of love, showing the way of love, is we're doing it by the lifestyle that we live, not just by the words that we say. Because you can say one thing and do another, and that's being a hypocrite. The, if you get down to the root of that word, it's, it's, it's the whole word for actor. You're putting, on a, you're putting on a mask, and you're pretending. That's why we call this real church. You don't have to pretend here. If you're going through something, it's okay to own it in, in our church. You can say, yeah, I'm struggling with this. Yeah, I'm battling with this. Yeah, I'm dealing with this. And you know what we'll do? We'll come alongside of you. We'll put our arm around you and like, let's keep walking this out because God loves you too much to leave you where you're at. He's going to take you to a place of change. Amen. So how do we live out this way? Well, it's not done or accomplished by our power or strength. It's by the power of his Holy Spirit working in us. It's living in relationship with Jesus. See, when you live in a relationship with the living God, here's what it will produce. It will produce a godly life. It will produce a life of tenderness. You'll start, I mean, I, I was up here during worship and I just started to cry. And I, I, I used to look at those preachers that like every time, every time they would get in worship, they'd just start crying. I'm like, they can turn it on and turn it off. But you know what happens? When you start hanging out with Jesus for a while, he tenderizes your heart. Your heart, instead of being a rock of stone, it becomes a soft, pliable heart. And you know what? I get in worship, and I, and, and I just felt the Holy Spirit fall in just such a precious way, and immediately tears came to my eye. Why? Because I'm so, we're so blessed that he honors us with his presence, because he doesn't have to. But we're so blessed that he honors us with his presence. That the very, the God of all this world comes and hangs out with us here. That's a blessing. So we got to live this out. And living this out, living in relationship will change you to be more like Jesus. You're going to have more mercy and grace. You're going to speak the truth in love, but you're going to have mercy and grace and tenderness and gentleness. But if you only know religion, and if that's what you have, you know what I found with religious people? Jesus found it in his day. Religious people have a tendency to be very judgmental and harsh. That's why you see a lot of people that, that know nothing but how bad everybody else is, and they point out everybody else's sin. Guess what? I have the Holy Spirit. You don't have to point out my sin. I already know it. That's why we're called to give the good news. But if you follow in the footsteps of the Pharisees, they had a form of godliness. They, they looked the part. They dressed the part. They acted the part. And you know what? They looked religious. Guess what? Your religion will turn more people away. But your love, if you truly love Jesus, will draw people to the heart of God over and over and over again. But judgment is not something that you're called to do. Listen to this. Jesus was point blank. He was talking about it. He said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Better be careful. As we used to say, you know, and I did kids ministry for a while. It's like when you're pointing your finger, there's one pointing away or two pointing away, but there's three pointing back at you. Guess what? Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I... I during teen years, we, me and a couple of my friends used to do skits, and there was one where it had, and we, we actually hooked up a cardboard plank, like, and, and walked, and, like, and, and we were bumping the mic with it and hitting each other, and it's like, it, when, you, when you put that in perspective and you go, oh my gosh, how ridiculous that is. But that is what we so many times do. We're constantly pointing fingers. Well, whatever you sow, if you're sowing judgment, guess what you're going to reap back? Judgment. If you're sowing grace and mercy, guess what you reap back? Grace and mercy. 
God didn't call us. Our, our lifestyles are not to be lifestyles that put other people down. You know, this judgmental attitude is, well, if I have to do it, you have to do it, or, or I'm better than you, and that's what some people want to do. But, but the sad thing is that's not what's going to lead people to Jesus. we got to tell them the good news. If you start off and go, you're a dirty, rotten sinner, guess what? They already know that. Most sinners know that they're sinners already. What they need to know is that there's a, a way to deal with their sin, and Jesus has already dealt with their sin. That's what they need to hear. So, are you living the way? Are you living the way? We're to be people who walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, love like Jesus. Judgmental attitudes will not proclaim the way. We need to let people see God's love and mercy and grace. And, and then when they receive that, the truth will set them free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I need Jesus to set me free. And he will. But we got to first show them the love. Here's the third thing, and I'm, I'm kind of bringing it to a close. Tell people the way. And how do we do that? We share the word in love. It says this in, in 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the, through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides in you. Before I go any further, you, do you see how God change, changed you? He changed you through the word. It was his love, and our love needs to be fervent toward other people. And it was through the word of God, which lives and abides in you. He goes on to say, because all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man as a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Guys, what do we need to share with the lost and dying world? We need to share the word of God. Because his word will never fail. His word will last forever. Because there's going to be a day... These bodies are going to die. All of the things that we accomplish are going to go away. But there's one thing that's going to last, and that's the word of the Lord. And if we share the word of the Lord, if we proclaim his word, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, we proclaim his story. We tell people of his birth, his signs and wonders, the way he lived. We tell them of his death, burial, and resurrection. We tell the story, his story, history. We tell his story, that'll change people's lives. The word will do that. And, and, and are you telling people the way? Here's the question we got to ask. Are we telling people the way? Are we telling them the word of God? Are we speaking the word of God? The word needs to come out of you. It needs to be in your mouth. It needs that word of truth that you're constantly speaking. Encourage people with the word of God. If you go, Pastor, I, I can't, you know, uh, it's kind of like the old uh, Steel Magnolia's little statement. If you can't say anything good, honey, come sit by me. We don't need to be like that. If you've got a problem with your tongue, start speaking the word. Put the word in there, and it, and it will teach your tongue how to be obedient. But you start speaking the word and you start saying nice things and you speak blessings over people. And God, I'm telling you, it will change the way you communicate. And then also tell others the way that God has worked in you. Tell them, do you, do you know your testimony? Do you know what God has done in you? Do you know how you got saved? Like, what did God do? What did he save you from? What did he save you to? What is he doing in your life right now? Well, I, 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 I don't know. You know, I, I've shared with you before, but when, when I got saved, I got saved at nine. I mean, I didn't have one of those rock and roll stories, that sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and God, and God saved me from all that. I don't have that. I got saved when I was nine. I went forward. I gave my life to Jesus. I've been living since, with him ever since. 
But the thing that the Lord showed me when I was in Bible college is I struggled with the spirit of fear from the time I was seven to the time I was nine because uh, of a cousin that just dropped dead one day of a heart attack at 21 years of age, and it freaked me out. And I had a spirit of fear. But when I gave my life to Jesus, because for two years, there was a light on in my room every night, and my parents would have to come in and hold my hand because I was so afraid of dying. I thought if I went to sleep, I wouldn't wake up. And they would sit there, and they would hold my hands, and they would pray for me. But when I gave my life to Jesus at nine, this is what happened. All that fear went away. Perfect love cast out all fear. And it wasn't until I was in Bible college and they said, write your testimony. And I'm like, I have no testimony, you know. And we had had these guest speakers come and talk about all the things that had happened to them. And it's like, I'm, I got saved when I was nine. Listen, God is at work in you. If you came to know Christ, he's done a work in you. Look back and see what God's done for you and tell others about that. Because you can tell your story and that will change people's lives. Share your faith in God. Share what your, your faith. I mean, faith is the ultimate adventure. Faith empowers us in, in, to break free of the things that hold us. And it also uh, gives us the ability to take hold of the promises of God. Share what God's doing in your life. When I share my story about my house or I share a story of how God met my need, listen, those are living tales of faith. Is God working in your life? If, if, you're not, if you don't have any stories to tell, you got to see, am I putting myself out there to trust God in faith? I'm challenging you now, but are you trusting God? Has God delivered you? Has God helped you overcome that? God wants to do that. Listen, faith will empower us to live a life of purpose and adventure. The greatest adventure you will ever live is a life of faith. When you start trusting, and that means that you have to trust so much that you risk it to where if it doesn't come through, guess what happens? You can fall on your face. If you never risk something, you're not really stepping out in faith. You got to risk something. Or you got to have something that is way over your head that you can't do on your own, but God supernaturally does. That's the adventure of it, is trusting God. And, and faith uh, frees us up to, ha to really not rely on the world system to answer us, but to truly trust God with everything and to believe him to answer prayers and things that we, we can't do on our own. Share your stories of faith. I mean, listen, Miss Liz, you, some of you know, Miss Liz broke her, broke her wrist a, a few months ago. Well, we have really crappy insurance. And my deductible was $7,000. That's a chunk of change. I don't have an extra $7,000 sitting in my bank account. I used to, but I don't have it now, you know? But I didn't have it at this time. But you know what? God supernaturally worked in that. Kind of like your, your thing, Chuck, where he was looking at a $68,000 bill and it dropped down. 87,000, sorry, it's even bigger. 87,000, it dropped down to eight. Six. See, I got it all wrong. But, but listen, it's that kind of thing that God supernaturally did that, and then he provided finances to take care of it. Why? Because I'm trusting God. I, I mean, instead of sitting there going, oh, my gosh, how are we going to pay this? I just go, okay, God, didn't see that one coming, but you did. So I don't know how we're going to handle it, but I'm trusting you. And you know what? He took care of it, and it's paid in full. Amen? Come on. Listen. But here's, here's another thing. Share your hope in his promises. When you have trusted God, listen, hope will give is what the world needs. That's why we call next door the Hope Center. Why? Because if there's ever been a time that this world needs something, they need hope. And we are people of hope. Why? Because hope is the assurance that God will do something, will do what he's promised that he will do. That's the hope I have. I have the blessed hope that one day I'm going to live in heaven. But, it, but a lot of Christians, that's where they stop. Well, one of these days in the sweet by and by, hallelujah, glory. You know what? God doesn't just want to help you in the sweet by and by. He wants you to help you in the here and now. 
It's supposed to, your faith should change your lifestyle, not just your eternal destination, but your lifestyle in the way that you live. It's hope is knowing that there's always something good just around the corner. It, hope creates an expectation of what God can do. And guys, that's the kind of hope. Our faith and trust in God gives us hope, the assurance, the expectation of what God is going to do in us and through us and for us. He will do all of that if we will take a step. And when we step into our role as the church and begin to live it out, man, it changes everything. And here's the last one, and I'm, I'm, I'm closing. I'm, I know I'm going a little long today, sorry. But share your love in action. 1 John three eighteen, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. You can't just tell somebody, well, bless you, brother, I love you. If they're going through something, get in there with them. Show your love in action. Don't just say, well, I love you, brother. How many times have you heard that? I love you. No, let's live it. Let's sacrificially give. Let's get in there with them and help them. Be the church. Let's be the church and point the way. I'm going to, I, I want to give you this last scripture and, and, and then I'm going to kind of bring it to a close. He, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, last time I checked, I hadn't met one of you that has, like, you go into a dark room and you glow. But you know what that light is? That's the light of his love shining through us. You, can, you meet people and you can tell that they're a loving person. They're, they're a person who, who truly cares. When you find somebody like that, what are you? You're drawn like a moth to a flame, right? You're drawn to somebody that's like that because you're like, oh my gosh, there's somebody that's real, that they're authentic, they love, they care. They Listen, you're drawn to people. That's what we're to do, to let our light so shine what we do, our good works. And it gives glory to who? The Father. This is the way. Will you bow your heads with me? Father God, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you've called us as your children You've called us out of darkness into this wonderful light. You've called us to live this. And Father, I thank you that you not only, not only call us, but you also equip us and empower us to live this life, to be a shining light of your love and your grace to a broken and hurting world. Father, thank you. Thank you for doing this work. If you're here today and you go, Pastor, I don't know Jesus, but I need Jesus today. I, 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 I don't know the way. I've never received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If there's anyone here today that needs that, is there anyone that I can pray with today? Okay. You said, Pastor, what you said today spoke to me and it, it, it moved me and I want to be the church. I want to be, I, I want to I step up and I want to I live the most excellent way. I want to be a person of love and grace and I want to impact my, my community. But I need God's help to live the way so I can be a Christian who lives not just in word, but in truth and in, in lifestyle. You need that. Just slip up a hand. Anybody, I want to pray for you. Yes. 
Father, right now you see these hands that they, they, they want they want to be ambassadors of love to this world that is so full of hate and, and anger. Father, I pray that you would give them, just pour out an anointing of your love, that they love like you love, that they live like you live, that they speak like you speak, that they are a catalyst for change in their workplace, in their homes, in their community, wherever they serve, wherever they have interaction and, and relationships. Father, I pray for just an anointing of your love that will break yokes of bondage, that will set captives free that will bring healing and wholeness to some people's lives. In Jesus' name, thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor.